All right, gentlemen, we are live on Facebook and uh, welcome to a Sigma America live stream along with Liam Duran and Darren White. Say hi, fellas. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. How's it going? Liam Duran is a Sigma ambassador and he is a longtime outdoor photographer who you may have seen a lot of his work um, depicted on the front of skiing magazines. Uh, that has basically been his bread and butter for a long time, but also during the off season. He does a lot of landscape photography and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So Liam, if you if you would just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what your expertise is as far as it uh, as far as landscape photography is concerned. Yeah, um, so I live out in Breckenridge, Colorado, and uh, uh, like Nick said, I do a lot of action sports, so a ton of skiing, but also mountain biking, trail running, hiking, backpacking, all that sort of thing. Um, but I do, you know, a fair amount of landscape as well. Um, you know, I, I kind of call my work more travelscape than landscape. Yeah. Um, you know, because I'm just kind of moving quickly through the landscape, shooting, you know, shooting sunrise and shooting sunset. Um, but I'm not, you know, a landscape photographer in the sense that I come back to the same location day after day after day to make sure I get that ultimate landscape shot. Um, so, yeah, so I love shooting landscapes. It's fun. It's kind of how I explore the, uh, the world around me. And I just enjoy it. It's great. All right. And Darren, also from Colorado, from uh, Littleton, I believe. You guys are sort of in the same general area on the outskirts of Denver. Um, yeah. You, uh, I... I first noticed your work when it, uh, I was looking at a lot of night sky photography. So you specialize in that as well as uh, very colorful landscapes and you do quite a bit of traveling yourself as well. I do, thanks Nick. Um, yeah, so I do a lot of nightscapes. I do a lot of uh, landscapes. And like Liam said, I, I do travel back to certain locations over and over again um, to get the right conditions, to get, get, to get that, that epic shot. Um, I love being out underneath the sky at night with the stars. In fact, I'm, as soon as I'm done here, we're, uh, we're headed out to Monarch Lake tonight. We're gonna go shoot the Milky Way over, over the lake, up by Grand Lake. So that's gonna be pretty cool. Um, I'm taking off for Montana next week. So yeah, I, I travel a lot. I traveled a lot during COVID, um, going to places where there were not a lot of people. So I keep myself and everybody else safe. And um, yeah, so. I do live in Littleton, uh, spent a lot of time in Colorado, spent a lot of time in Oregon along the coast, the mm. Pacific Northwest, and just, I enjoy being outdoors, doing hiking, biking, taking pictures, just enjoying the scenery. All right, so we're gonna take a couple minutes just to sort of let our, our viewers build up, but um, let's get started by first discussing something that recently came out uh, from Sigma, and that is the Sigma FPL camera. Now, of course, the main thing that um, is right on the top of the spec sheet is 61 megapixels. So this is sort of a landscape photographer's perfect tool. Um, it's very dense and weather sealed, and it's a perfect tool that just kind of stick in the backpack along with a, a very small selection of tough lenses. So when you're bringing this out in the field, it, uh, it works perfectly for landscapes. You both had the opportunity to shoot with it. In fact, it was this very model right here that is, has oh. made, the, made the rounds from uh, <laughs> coast friend. to coast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, why don't you guys just give us a little bit of feedback about how the camera worked for you, what lenses you used with it, and uh, what sort of imagery you came up with, with all of that um, megapixel power. Darren, go ahead. Okay. so. My experience with the FPL was uh, in the Pacific Northwest for two weeks and then another almost week in Moab. The picture you're seeing behind me was shot with the FPL um, one morning in Arches National Park. Um, God, for me, it was, it was just a blessing because my camera bag is normally about 45, 46 pounds. Mm -hmm. And when, when Sigma off, offered me the opportunity to, to shoot with the FPL, the new version, the FPL, I, I jumped at it is so small so compact and the three lenses the new i series lenses like the total weight of all of it was was less than four pounds so it was just my back was thanking me um i will admit that i was a little concerned about the image quality the first couple of days i was taking the images and i was looking at them on the back of the camera mm -hmm. but I, I didn't have a chance to sit down and look at them until i got more situated in the, my travels 
And once I did, and I looked at those images, I was just like, holy cow, these things are razor sharp. They're huge. And I just, I just kept thinking about the printing possibilities. I mean, how big can we go without upsizing, you know? And so I have some very large prints that are in the works that I'm going to be getting to later this summer. Um, and I, I, I was just truly happy with it. I absolutely loved it. I loved how compact it was. Um, and, and the file sizes were, were amazing. And for me as a landscape photographer, you know, I don't need a, I don't need a lot of speed. I don't need a lot of the bells and whistles that it has on it. Um, I wish I knew how to do video because I would have loved to try it with video, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't do video. So hopefully <laughs> there's other people out there who do, but yeah, I, it was a great experience and I, I'd love to, to use it again if I had the opportunity. Uh, Liam, you also had an opportunity to get out there and uh, do a little bit of shooting out in the desert. I believe you were in Utah. Yeah. And uh, you paired it with the 28 to 70 contemporary, which I'm holding right here. And that makes a very, very small package. Yeah. And uh, also the 100 to 400 millimeter lens. So yeah. uh, give us your initial thoughts about how the FPL worked for you. Out on the, it was uh, awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, without a doubt, it was that 61 megapixel kind of headliner, which is what got me the most. And, uh, you know, I am looking to... Uh, to incorporate some higher megapixel cameras into my, especially into my landscape stuff. Um, just cause I am selling more prints these days. I'm doing more with the landscape work than I have in the past. Um, and, and so I think that higher megapixel, like, like Darren was saying, like, uh, you can make it m a much bigger print out of it without having to go into up resing or upsizing, which I don't have to be, to be honest, I don't have much experience with that. I've never really done that before. Right. Um, but, you know, it looks like, I mean, well, even on like my older cameras, I was getting 20 by 30 prints um, out of like 20 to 24 megapixel cameras, which I'm sure I could out of, you know, my Sony a7 III or a9 II. Uh, but I'm really interested on, in seeing what the 61 megapixel print looks like at size. Um, I've done some smaller ones just right here at the house. Uh, but I would love to see them at, I, I don't know, Darren, how big do you think you could get out of a, out of 61 megapixel camera? Uh, so if you, depends on what you print, but a native file size, um, what is it? 92 by 61. So, uh, you could do a canvas at 120 DPI. And I would say you're looking at 55 by 80. Whoa. Easy. Wow. Easy. It's, it's interesting that you guys are bringing this up and talking about this specifically because in the age of uh, digital, you know, and it, everything's on Facebook or Instagram where the resolution doesn't really matter, the print quality is where the resolution really comes into its own. So sure, to have yeah. that many megapixels to work with and to be able to put something out um, at, such a, at such a high resolution and then put it up on a wall as a piece of art. Um, I think that's that's really important to uh, to discuss here. And also, I, I should say that a lot of people over the course of the past year, partly due to this uh, to the pandemic, have sort of gravitated towards landscape photography as a hobby. And I think that people are starting to find that printing out their work is really an enjoyable thing that we've been missing for quite some time. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, absolutely. You know, everyone takes pictures on their phones nowadays, like all their kids photos are right here. And then as soon as they lose their phone, like a lot of people don't back up their their phones. I do. I'm sure you guys do as well. But a lot of people don't. You lose that phone and there goes two years of all your kid photos are gone. We never used to operate this way. It was always done in print. Um, and I'm a, you know, not to, to take this into the print world discussion, but um but I'm a, I'm a big, big believer in making prints, you know, a, a couple of years ago when my father passed and we had family friends over and everyone sits down and the first thing you do is you pull out pictures and you look at the pictures and it's like moving forward, that's, that's not going to happen anymore. People are going to pull out phones and be digging for, you know, forever trying to find a mm -hmm. picture from 18 years ago and it's just not going to happen. Um, so that's kind of one of the reasons that I enjoy printing as well. So, you know, with four by six and five by sevens, little things, I'll print up all sorts of just Christmases, 4th of July's kid pics, you know, just random stuff, not professional work, just, you know, 
professional photographers do take non-professional photos too. I take lots of snapshots of the kids. Oh, yeah. Are you saying you actually take pictures on your phone, Liam? Because I, I do. Yeah, I did today. I mean, I don't like try to do anything with them other than have like, you know, whatever, an Instagram story. But yeah, I take pictures of my kids all the time with my phone and um, with my real camera as well. We've got a couple of questions here, and I, I just want to remind anyone who's watching, this is a Q&A, not just between me and, and the guys here, but feel free to jump in with your own questions about landscape photography, any Sigma gear, any sort of tips and tricks that you might want to run by these guys. Um, they have a lot of knowledge in this field, so please feel free to, to jump in with some questions in the comments. Um, one that you guys can answer and one that I'll answer. The first one, which is for me, will we see any Sigma lenses for the RF mount? We don't know. I, I'll put this right <laughs> up front, whether it's uh, a 70 to 200 for Sony, whether it's stuff for uh, RF mount, whether it's stuff for Fuji X mount. Uh, all of those things are floating out there. People want to know. We don't know. If there's anything to announce, it will be announced by Sigma Japan publicly. So I'm afraid we don't have a roadmap for you guys. But just if you're waiting for your favorite lens to come out in your mount, all I can say is sit tight and hopefully we'll have it for you in the future. Um, and now for you guys regarding the FBL, uh, how is the dynamic range on these? Because you are shooting in pretty um, dynamic lighting conditions when you're out there. So uh, Liam, why don't you start on this one and then Darren follow up? Um, yeah, I, I thought it was fine. I don't know what technically it is, I, you know, 13, 14, 15 stops. I have no idea. Um, I am not the most technical shooter in the world. That's I'm not a pixel peeper. I don't dig that deep into my files. Um, but from what I could see, I was, uh, and I'll show you guys in, you know, when we go through a couple pictures later, but, um, to me, it looked really good. Um, I had no issues with it. That's for sure. Darren. Uh, yeah. So my, the way I shoot is I always expose to the right so that I don't have to bring up the shadows any more than I absolutely have to. But, um, some of my seascapes that I shot while I was in Oregon, um, the sun was setting. So I was shooting towards the sun. So that automatically darkens the shadows and I didn't have any issues bringing up the shadows. So, um, I mean, I would, I would compare it to a Nikon D810, D850. Um, I didn't do any side-by-side -side comparisons, but I shoot enough to, to know what a good file is and what a good file is not. And I, I can tell you guys that the files from the FPL are, are fantastic and yeah. super easy to work with. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at a few of those files. Uh, Darren, since you mentioned it, why don't you bring up one of your shots? Now you went out to the Pacific Northwest with the i-series lenses and those are the 24 millimeter f3.5 dgdn contemporary as well as a 35 millimeter f2 and a 65 millimeter f2 and these are all compatible with sony e-mount cameras or l-mount cameras and that would be the fp uh, panasonic full frames and leica full frames yes. and um Normally you shoot with, you know, the big wide art lenses, like the 14 to 24, things like that. But this time you had something very small, a very small trio of lenses that you took with you. Uh, tell us how those worked for you and how you were able to achieve some of these uh, beautiful shots. Okay. So just being brutally honest, I have to admit that when I got the lenses, I thought, man, are these, I hope these aren't, aren't kit lenses. Um, they're super <laughs> small. And that's what they reminded me of was, Right. with some of the smaller kit lenses and uh to remind you of that 50 millimeter that you get the first time you upgrade from a kit lens right the they're, 50, they're definitely not like that they they are have the size and the, they're compact but they right. are anything except for um kit lenses so this is this is an image i shot with the 24 millimeter uh dgdn it's 100 iso there's absolutely no noise in the shadows that I had to bring up a little bit. Um, 100 ISO and a sixth of a second. And it's, it, it's impressively sharp. I'm, yeah. I, I don't even know what to say. I mean, Sigma has done a, an amazing job with this camera lens combo or even the lenses. Um, yeah, it's... It, 
I mean, just even on the Zoom call, obviously you're never going to get your highest quality on a Zoom meeting, but I can already like kind of gather the sharpness, especially even in the foreground rocks there. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. I know that that probably on your screen at home on your awesome monitor probably looks incredible. Yeah. yeah you know what? I'll, uh, I'll include the link to uh, Darren's recent blog piece that uh, highlights a lot of these pictures. I'll put that in the comments. Now, I believe, Darren, this one was shot with a 24? Yes, that's correct. I noticed that a lot of your shots tended to gravitate towards that 24. Now, one of the initial things that people started d discussing when the lens came out was, well, why is it only a 3.5? Why isn't it faster than that? For a landscape photographer, especially someone who takes pictures that show a ton of detail from foreground all the way to the distant horizon, uh, that 3.5 is not a handicap at all. No, I, in fact, I was going to take the lens, see about taking the lens to Moab to do night stuff, but at night it would be, you know, I was better off with the 14 to 24 to eight, right. um, just for that little extra width and, and light. But this was shot at F14 and it's tack sharp from front to back. And I was probably, I would say three, two, three feet away from the closest foreground rocks here. So, yeah. Um, d d quick tech question. Do you focus stack at all or do you mostly shoot, um, you know, real small apertures and go with your depth of field that way? So just recently I've started to focus stack, but you can't really focus stack very well when you're shooting moving objects like water. Um, so this is just a single shot, not focus okay. stacked. Cool. Yeah. Oh, I've, never seen, I've never seen this one before. <laughs> yeah, so this one, this one was 65. And oh, that 65 is as sharp as any 50 or 65 I've ever seen. So it's beautiful. Ah, the colors are gorgeous. Our lupins just bloomed like seriously yesterday. Yeah. Now, yeah, how, do you, how do you feel about the uh, 65 millimeter focal length, Darren? Um, I, I think that's something that people aren't used to seeing. And maybe initially it would put them off to say, well, why would I get a 65 when there's a 50 and an 85? And those are the, the, the ones that most people gravitate towards. Um, does the 65 no. hit a sweet spot or is it, is it weird for you? Did it take some getting used to? For, for me personally, in all, in all honesty, yeah, it took a little bit of getting used to. Um, you know, most of the stuff I do is more towards the 14 to 24 range or, sure. or more towards the 70 to 200 range. But that, that 65 really is a nice sweet spot between 50 and 85. So if you have the opportunity or you're in a location where you can move forward or move back to, to get the scene you want, definitely go for it. I mean, it's, God, it's so small and so light that you'd kind of be dumb not to have it in your bag. You know? <laughs> um, I saw another one of the shots that you had there in your thumbnails was the, uh, the bridge over the, uh, the green water. Uh, that was one of my favorites. And also from one of my favorite lenses in the I series, the 35 millimeter yep. F2. Um, how did you uh, fare with that lens uh, as far as its, you know, weight and compactness as well as its sharpness and light gathering capability it's it's among the faster ones in the i series yeah the um the 35 was fantastic um absolutely no issues with it razor sharp um the color the contrast everything was just super i mean just is what it's what you would expect from a a 35 millimeter prime lens mm -hmm. and it definitely hit the nail on the head it's just beautiful. Oh, that's great. Beautiful shot. Thanks. Now, what you mentioned specifically in, in your recent blog post was uh, the, the weight combined of the lenses and the camera, uh, and that you were able to travel with this without any sort of wear and tear in your back. So if nice. you don't mind refreshing my memory, how, what that came out to? <laughs> yeah, so it's under four pounds. Um, hey, come on. <laughs> no, seriously, I weighed it. The FPL, the, the batteries, the media cards and the three lenses are under four pounds. And that's just awesome for someone who needs to 
throw that in a small backpack and just go out to, especially if you're going in locations where maybe the footing is a little bit unstable, you need to make mm -hmm. sure that you have your hands free and available. Uh, you also want to save room and weight for your tripod, you know, so that small amount of weight is really important for someone who's really getting out there into the, into the wild. Yeah, that's impressive. What about a uh, viewfinder? Did you use the optional viewfinder? Or did you use just the back of the screen? So for me, I used the viewfinder just to see what it did. Um, I didn't use it to actually shoot with because that's just not my style. Um, but I did, I did put it on and I did look through it to see how it, how it would work. But um, I, I found that the back of the camera worked really well and I didn't have any issues. I think I, generally I, speaking, yeah, Liam, um, go ahead. I was just gonna say like in Moab is what, like I could see the, you know, using the back of the screen pretty well in the kind of darker forest, but in Moab, did you also use the LCD or are you using the viewfinder there? I use the viewfinder or I use the LCD for everything. Oh, cool. Interesting. Yeah. Um, one thing I just want to touch on real fast for, for people that don't know is that this, this is really crazy. And this is one of the things that attracted me to the original FP camera. Um, the ISO goes down to six. Yeah. Not 64, not 600, but six. So <laughs> this was shot with ISO 12. And if you want to shoot in the in the daytime and still get long exposures, th this is your this is the answer. Um, yeah, without adding any filters, no ND filters, not a nothing. you don't this have to add ISO all that. twelve. Yeah, and I mean that that saves the weight of having to add filters to your to your arsenal as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I noticed weight, that as well. Having to, having to clean them and make sure that you know where right. that, you know, it's filters as, as much as they can be useful can be a super big hassle. So, right. uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And then this one just real fast was shot with ISO six. And believe me, it's, it's razor sharp. <laughs> that is ISO so cool. Six. And when, that you blow, you, when you blow those up, you're not getting any any grain. And that's that's really no. the appeal of getting an ISO that low. Not only can you shoot at very long exposures uh, in the daytime, but you're also able to minimize any possible grain. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sorry, Liam, you were going to say something. Uh, oh, what was I going to say? I can't remember. It was probably <laughs> something really smart and witty and, and thoughtful, but I just totally forgot. I think uh, it was about the location. You shot all that. Oh, in, oh that's, in that's right. I was wondering, right? Yeah. Yeah. Was that Oregon coast, that little skeleton ship? Yeah, North Oregon coast. It's the uh, Peter Iredale shipwreck. Ah. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I don't know anything about photography in that area at all. I've never been there. I've never shot it, but now you're kind of making me want to go. <laughs> it looks awesome. Uh, the Pacific Northwest is, is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have a really good friend that shoots up there, a well-known photographer that just crushes it in the Pacific Northwest. Nice. Guys, we get a few questions before we continue on. Uh, Antonio wants to know, I guess this would be in reference to your shots, Darren. Uh, did you do any exposure blending or were, were you able to retain the highlights and shadows in one shot? So all of the shots that I just showed you are single exposures, no blending. And that goes back to my my shooting technique of I always try to expose to the right and go as far as I can before I blow the highlights out. That'll give me the most detail in the shadows and um, just gives me a better file to work with. If you underexpose your images and you have to just crank up those shadows, that's that's when you're going to see issues with with any camera. So when you say that, what kind of issues are you talking about specifically? Because I've read the opposite opinion where it's uh, people prefer to expose to the left so that they can bring up the shadows because they, they feel it's easier to make those shadows um, noticeable and make those, you know, look better in the file rather than trying to handle highlights. So, so for me personally, um, I want to get as much data as I can on the original digital file. Mm -hmm. So by exposing to the right without clipping the highlights or without blowing the highlights out, I can do that. If I underexpose, then I'm not getting as much data. And, and this is, you can test this by going out and exposing to the right 
and getting as much data on the file as you can and then doing the exact same thing and, and shooting the way you normally would underexposed and then take them into Photoshop or, or Lightroom or whatever your preference is and look at the file size. The, files, the file size in megabytes on the properly exposed one will be much larger than the underexposed one simply because you have more data. And when you have more good data to work with, you're going to get a better overall image. And if you're, if you're just taking these pictures to post on Instagram or Facebook, then it doesn't matter. Nobody can see the noise. But if you're going to print these as 40 by 60s or larger, you're going to want to have the best starting point that you can get. Yeah, you definitely don't want to deliver an image that big to your client no. and have them see uh, defects in the image uh, after the fact. That's an expensive print. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, um, this one is sort of a more general gear question. Monica is asking whether uh, she should get the 12 to 24 millimeter or the 14 to 24 millimeter. I guess, first of all, it depends on what you're shooting with. If you're shooting on a Sony or an L mount platform, there is no 12 to 24, although you could adapt it. Um, right. But I'm partial to the 14 to 24 personally. It's got a little bit more light than the 12 to 24 F4. And I don't really find myself often needing that extra two millimeters of range. However, there are times when it comes in useful. So maybe you guys can weigh in. Yeah, I'll take a stab at that first. Um, you know, for my landscape stuff, and uh, I, I, I'm 1424 all day. And some people might find this surprising, but for my action sports stuff for skiing and mountain biking, I will take the 12. Um, <laughs> you can really really exaggerate how big the cliff a skier is going off of with the 12 millimeter lens you get underneath with 12 millimeters and you turn a five foot cliff into like a 30 foot cliff it's very you can very easily distort reality um, and i use it for that reason alone quite often in my nature photography i'm not looking to distort anything i'm a very um uh, true to life photographer when it comes to my nature work and my, uh, you know, my landscape work. So for me, when it comes to landscape, I'd go 14, 24. I, I've never used the 12 to 24. So I honestly don't have a, an opinion, but for me, for what I do, I can honestly say that the two millimeters is not, not a deal breaker for me. I can, I can easily work with 14 millimeters and and take three steps back if I need to, you know? Yeah. Um, I yeah, think one I of like, the, I like having the 2.8 as well. I All was right. going to say, I, I think one of the things that I, I don't want to call it a misconception, but one of the things that people generally consider when they're thinking about landscape photographer photography is that wider is always better. And that's not necessarily the case. Wide can be great if that's what you want to shoot. But a lot of the time, Getting in there with a telephoto lens provides you with a completely different perspective, gives you a lot of yeah. compression. And I'm bringing this up because that's something that is featured in a lot of Liam's uh, nature work. So Liam, why don't you bring up some of the images that you shot with the FPL? Yeah, sure. And um, you had a couple zoom lenses when you went on this trip, the yep. 28 to 70, which we mentioned before, and the 100 to 400 DGDN. Yeah, and I think everything that I have here is with, I think, with either of those uh, two lenses. I, I could be wrong. There might be something else in there. But uh, yeah, I got out. I just had it for a couple of days. I think I had five or six days with the camera. Um, and I just did a quick road trip. And my goal on this road trip was to find uh, the kind of the bright spring colors in the desert, like just as the cottonwoods and aspens uh, as the leaves pop out, it gives a really unique bright color. And that was kind of my goal this trip. And uh, uh, at times I found it, at times I didn't. So this is just me kind of kind of ripping around through the desert on a real fast, I think I was out three nights, four days. Um, <laughs> I like how you, you're, you're totally uh, like, oh, this is nothing. I was just going around the desert and not even paying attention. And it's like this epic <laughs> shot. <laughs> well, you know, it's like, so, yeah, I guess my, my, this is what this trip specifically was very much what I would call a travel scape. I was right. not camping out at one spot with a very specific image in, in mind, which I will do from time to time. But this trip was just about touring, uh, being on the go, going fast and seeing what I see. And I would just stop and pull over and shoot what I saw. Um, so this is what 
unfurled in front of me as I was on the road. Um, this, this picture here is Factory Butte. It's a well-known area uh, in Utah, but I'm shooting it from a slightly different angle. This is from Highway 12 between Hanksville and Capitol Reef. Uh, beautiful drive, I might add. Um, but I think one of the things I wanted to point out here was how often I used, uh, I went into the mode where I could change my aspect and I shoot a, shot a lot of the, is it 16.9? I believe this is 16.9. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I, and I use that function way more on this camera. I, I don't know why, maybe because I wasn't afraid at 61 megapixels, I wasn't afraid of losing too much information. Um, but I found it and I saw Darren on his first shot, that seascape photo. It looked like he also had shot in 16, nine. Um, yeah. so that's a really cool little feature. Yeah. Um, someone had asked earlier about dynamic range and I just shot this, you know, this was more of like a test photo than what I was really looking to do. Uh, but I wanted to shoot right in, and you'll have to excuse my computer. It's old and slow and it takes like a <laughs> month to load a 61 megapixel file. But, um, but this one, I just kind of wanted to see what it looked like shooting hard backlit. Um, the color looks fine. It looks really nice. It'll be, look even better when it actually loads. Um, but I shot it in black and white too. And there's tons of info there. Like that was a pretty dark shadow. And I did pull that up a little bit in post, pulled the shadows up. And there's all the information that I wanted and needed for me, at least for my needs, um, was totally there. Uh, so that's just kind of showing the two. I actually like the black and white a little bit better myself, but. And a nice sun star there, a nice sort of even sun yeah, star. Yeah, I was with, just with letting the star break up. <laughs> yeah, just letting it break apart right as it hit the top of the formation there. Um, Liam, real quick, I've noticed in a lot of your sort of behind the scenes videos when you're shooting these these uh, travelscapes, as you call them, mm -hmm. um, you'll be waiting for the light to change a lot of the times. And sure. I think this is something that people may not consider when they first get into landscape photography is that is how important that light is. Because while you were just sort of going through the desert and shooting what you see, you still didn't want to take it while it was completely overcast or there was direct sunlight in a way that didn't really fit the image. You're very particular about how the light falls on that on that landscape. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that is, that's what we're doing, right? Where our entire art form is based on light. So, so I guess I kind of make quick shrift of it when I say I'm just kind of cruising around, but that doesn't mean I don't sit in a location and wait for the lighting situation that I want. I mean, mm -hmm. I certainly will do that. Um, for an, an example is this photo right here. Um, when they first came upon this scene, the light was on the foreground and I just didn't like it. It was really intense and it was just too much and it stole the show from the background a little bit. So I just kind of let the cloud move and I want, and it lit that middle ground nicely. I kind of liked it. Um, you know, other people might want to do it the other way. I probably shot it with the light in the foreground as well, but I ended up liking the one where the light's in the middle ground. And then also, you know, just little dabs of light across the Henry mountains in the background there. This um, is another one you shot with the 100 to 400, I believe. Yep, um, this is 100 400. Um, yeah. Yep. And, you know, I shoot a little more classic bell curve, I would say. This one actually looks a little on the left, um, probably because of all this foreground here. Mm -hmm. But uh, but in general, I shoot a little more bell curve. Uh, I don't know why. Probably just comes from, uh, you know, shooting for magazines and whatnot, and they tend to like a nice even, you know, I don't shoot right. I don't shoot left. I kind of keep it in the middle, um, which is, you know, works for me. Um, what else do we have here? You know, so the one thing that you get when you are just in one spot for one morning is you might not have the most optimal conditions. Mm. This sunrise was so close to being absolutely epic and it just never quite <laughs> happened. Um, you know, th there were these spotlights moving through the desert and I just was fingers crossed that one of these lights was going to hit uh, Temple of the Sun, uh, sorry, Temple of the Moon here, and it just wouldn't quite, didn't quite happen. Um, I'm showing the photo anyway. This is not one that I would probably print or sell or put on display um, other than, uh, you know, a situation like this, because I still like the photo. Um, but this one was fairly dark, and I did raise the shadows, uh, that foreground info, quite a bit. 
Um, all my work, again, I do all single shot photos. Um, I don't do fake skies. I don't do fake foregrounds or any of that. Um, for me, it has to happen in one place at one time. For me, that's what photography is. Um, I, I think taking that approach is, uh, I guess people might see it as a, as a purist kind of outlook. Um, but then again, there are people who would argue, say, all right, well, Luminar 4 is great because you can do that sky replacement and it makes it all the more epic. But on the other hand, people notice it. Discerning, yeah. discerning uh, viewers will notice that that sky has appeared in, in, many, in many photographs. Yeah, you know, the Instagram public will pretty much gobble that up. And mm. it's a great way to do It's just not what I do. I, I have no interest in it. Uh, it's just not me. It's just not my personal thing. I'm not going to judge anyone else that does it. That's not my thing either. But sure. for me, if it didn't happen, I'm not going to pretend that it did. And if I did, like if I were to add a sky, maybe I would, I would definitely call it out as such. I would not try to pass it off as though... I was the only guy at, you know, Mesa Arch that captured a sunrise that no one else saw. Right. Um, and then you're not also, you're also not going to go as far as to say, well, I'm only going to do stuff straight out of camera. Everyone does a fair amount of editing. That's part of the process. But I've oh, seen absolutely. that argument. I've seen that argument too. Is that all right? Well, if you're focus stacking, then that's not really the way it looks, you know? Uh, you know, if it, like I said, my definition, if it <laughs> happened, Got if it. all of it happened in one place at one time, it's a photo. Other than that, you know, you're looking at digital art, which is awesome. Don't get me wrong. It's great. But true. Um, so this is what I was after on my entire road trip. And I found precious few leaves that were actually kind of starting to just pop. Um, but this, you know, this I liked this one, you know, I like the gray, uh, kind of the gray slopes in the background that kind of seem to have arms that wrap around the tree and the tree has some nice character there. Uh, and that was kind of like, that was kind of my goal of this trip. And I just didn't see a whole lot of it. Um, but I did catch a couple, which was nice. Um, and this, I believe that's probably 100, 400 as well. So yeah, I shoot a ton of long lens uh, landscape. Um, I'll just do a couple real quick. Uh, factory butte from the other side. Again, I, ne I just never really caught it with great light, but I do like the subtle tonality of black to white in this one I do like it better than the color was just just I mean that's what it looked like it was a really weird what I call greasy light it was just a, greasy yeah greasy gray <laughs> light that's what I call it um which I typically you know usually get that in winter with ski photography and mm. it's the worst light for me to shoot in you're just like eh. although you know as a professional i should say there's no such thing as bad light just bad photographers <laughs> um this was my my very one of my very few other uh nice uh you know little backlit spring trees uh and here again i'm on the on the 100 400 and then lastly um i love going to see all these uh ancient pueblo ruins that are all you know these are all over the place in south uh southeast utah and this one was with the 2870. So I wanted to make sure I did get a good 2870 shot in there as well. Uh, really neat place to visit. This is uh, Mule Canyon uh, and it's just a really cool spot. So uh, I'm sure you know that this particular spot is pretty well known, has probably been photographed many times. Um, yeah. As landscape photographers, you've probably seen work that you've done basically replicated on the internet it's go oh, all right well someone already got that shot um how important is it to you to get out there and get something unique uh because for those of us who go out and we don't really have a big landscape portfolio we take this great shot and we're all proud of it and then we see the exact same thing uh, online somewhere and it's kind of disheartening so right. how often do you make it a point to get off the beaten path and find something different or is it still really important to you to, to go and get those landmarks, those, those places that have been photographed a million times, but maybe you can find a different perspective? Um, well, for me, you know, I'm not a huge iconic landscape photographer. Don't get me wrong. I certainly have shot my Oxbow Bend photos and, uh, you know, I've been to Mesa Arch and I didn't even pull out my camera. Um, I think it's cool. I think mm. people should do it. It's fun to do regardless. Um, but, you know, some of those places, your side, you know, Mesa Arch in particular, it's six minute hike off the road and you will be 
you are surrounded by humans and that's not generally the reason that I'm outdoors shooting. It's not, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you shouldn't go do that. Cause like I said, it's fun to do and you should go get your shot. Um, I'd spend a lot of time in the back country. So I do multi-day backpacking trips with my camera and you can find very unique photos that no one, or maybe not no one, but hardly anyone has ever shot. And for me, that's far more rewarding and exciting. Uh, if you're a gallery owner or you're an Instagram guy, those tend to be less exciting. But for me personally, I find them far more rewarding. Yeah. Where I, do you? Yeah. Where do you weigh in on this, Darren? So, for me, it can be something just as simple as like the picture you see in my background. This is the entrance to Arches National Park. Uh, you probably haven't seen more than ten or fifteen pictures that look like this. Uh, because you have to park your car, you have to walk up a small hill and, and get to this viewpoint, which people, everybody has to drive by it to get into Arches National Park. And there's thousands and thousands of people that do every day. But by having a vision in my head and thinking, hey, these roads are curvy, I need to walk around a little bit to find a good vantage point, And then I need to figure out the best time to come and shoot this because you're not going to get this shot in the middle of the day with the sun. Um, but I used right before sunrise so I could have the light hitting the mountain and then the long exposure for the car trails. Um, so this is, this is something that makes it unique in and of itself. But even when I go out and photograph like old buildings and things like that, and I'm with some friends, it can be the difference between having your camera at eye level and having your camera super high or having your camera super low that can totally change the perspective and the perception of any scene that you're shooting. So, you know, like Liam goes into the back country where there's not a lot of people. If, if you just shoot super low or super high or from a different angle, your images are going to be different than other people's. So what I generally like to do is I like to see where other people are, are setting up. And then I'll usually find a different place that is slightly different. I've noticed in my own uh, adventures that occasionally if I want to get a different vantage point, it's usually in an area where I'd be trespassing. Uh, <laughs> how often do you skate that line? Because that, I don't want to go off and disturb any wildlife or any places where it's, you know, where we're not allowed to go because they're taking care of the trails or whatnot. So, I mean, it's, the general advice is stay where you're supposed to stay, I would right. imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah, so a lot of the old abandoned places that I shoot, you know, if they have a fence around them, if they have, they don't have a road up to them, or if there's a no trespassing sign, you know, then I don't, I don't go to them or try to try to get a shot that I shouldn't. Um, if there's, you know, wildflowers that are blooming, you want to stay away from stepping on those and don't walk through the, the natural area where plant life is growing because it takes so long after it's been ruin to to come back you know it doesn't just happen year after year so if you damage it it could be five six years before it comes back um yeah just be respectful of nature be respectful of people's property um but i, I will tell you that you know it, it's tempting sometimes to to want to get a certain shot but i also don't want the consequences that may go along with it so it's right. yeah. always respectful yeah. <laughs> This, yeah, it's a little different, you know, rural Colorado and, uh, and Utah, um, people take trespassing very seriously as they should. And, um, I just don't even mess with it. No way. Yeah. yeah I mean, I'm on Long Island in New York and I was taking some photos of the Fire Island lighthouse the other day yeah. and there's one boardwalk and that's where you go. Everywhere else is dunes and there's a marker every 20 feet that says stay off the dunes so why can't you walk on the dunes is what's up with that i don't know but, but you I, can... I think you guys can probably agree that being a, a good steward of your environment is you know an important thing whether you're a landscape photographer or not whether you're just a visitor or a hiker because you oh. never know you never know who's going to see you walking on those dunes <laughs> and take a picture and i guarantee you get called out and that that could i mean especially with a job like what you have i mean that could that could ruin it you know you just you everybody has phones everybody's taking videos 
Um, you just don't want to do anything wrong. Just be respectful of nature, be respectful um, of where you are. But, you know, you could get a shot of that lighthouse just by doing something totally different, like a super long exposure, you know, like throw on an ND10 filter and, and do like a 10 minute long exposure or something. And it'll have a totally different effect than somebody that just walks up, snaps a shot and leaves. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a good point. There, there are ways of getting unique perspectives without having to actually change your, uh, your shooting location. So if you're, you know, in a bind and you can't really get off the beaten path, then stay on it and find another way to make that location look uh, different. Um, Antonio chimed in here in the comments that he says, in my opinion, using a longer focal length will give you more unique perspectives. And that is sort of in line with what Liam does occasionally breaking out that 100 to 400, do, uh, adding a little bit compression to those shots and taking a picture that probably hasn't been done many times because everyone else is going out there with a wide angle lens yep. or their phone. So, <laughs> right. which is a wide angle lens. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I fully back, I think every landscape photographer should have a, a, a 7200 or a 100 400 in their pack guaranteed everyone, like you said, a lot of people are like, Oh, I just bring my 1424 my 1635. And that's what I shoot landscape with. And don't get me wrong, you can do great work with either of those lenses. But mm -hmm. absolutely, um, you know, especially in places, I feel like, uh, you know, Darren chime in here, but I feel like the desert Southwest is even more, uh, is even more important to have that longer focal length, the 7,200 or 100, 400. I, I agree a hundred percent. Um, after I got my, my Sigma 70 to 200, I started shooting Astro with it and people are like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm shooting the Orion Nebula or I'm shooting the, the dark horse Nebula or Ro Fuchi. And they're like, really? And I'm like, yeah. And then, <laughs> We'd get back into class and I'd show them the pictures. They're like, wow. But not only can you, you know, use a longer lens for something like that, but the sharpness of those lenses is just fantastic. And yeah, I know a lot of people that have bought that lens on my recommendation and they're just totally happy with it. So yeah, a longer lens is definitely something you want to have in your pack just to change perspective and not have to worry about sacrificing image quality. Right. I started with the 7200 because for an action sports photographer, that's like a go to focal length. Sure. And then I, you know, th we're talking a long time ago, but when I started shooting nature, I was always shooting wide as well. But I had that 7200. I started using that more and uh, and I and I liked it. So here we are <laughs> shooting lots of long lens landscapes. Yeah, nice. Well, uh, I have to say, I I hope that uh, everyone takes the, the lessons that we've learned here today. And uh, over the course of the past year, as everyone's been able to spend more time outside uh, away from other people and we can continue to enjoy landscape photography in all its forms uh, from every focal length using any kind of gear, but mostly Sigma gear. Thank you. <laughs> um, so guys, I wanna really uh, thank you both for uh, chiming in today and offering your insight and your expertise. And uh, your varying perspectives too, because Liam and, and Darren, you both are from the same area. You both got your your beard going, your 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 Colorado guys through and through. <laughs> but uh, you definitely offer completely different perspectives on landscape photography and how you approach it. So I really appreciate you bringing that to the table today. And I also want to um, thank the Facebook Live audience for those of you who came in and asked some questions. Really appreciate that. And of course, this will be available on Facebook and we'll put it on YouTube too, so that anyone who missed this, uh, this live stream can check it out later. So uh, guys, just before we sign off, I put your Instagram handles in the, uh, in the comments, but if you want to let everybody know where they can follow you. Yeah. Instagram, uh, Darren underscore white underscore photography. That's the best place. And yeah, then just... uh, you've also got a website too, Darren. Yeah. It's uh, darrenwhitephotography.com keep it pretty simple <laughs> hey what do you know mine is liam duran photography.com go. Go imagine <laughs> and then uh the instagram is liam underscore duran underscore outdoors awesome thank you so much guys for for joining me today and hey, uh, thanks, offering Nick. your perspectives today really appreciate thanks, it thanks darren yep see you guys later All bye right, guys take care guys bye.